Thank you for having me on the, the panel. I'll um, start with a brief framing of the, the problem at hand um, and then uh, hand over to my two fellow panelists to discuss um, the opportunities for um, content regulation to combat extremism and terrorism online. Um, so as, as most of you know, nowadays almost every radicalization process and every violent terrorist attack has some online component to it. This can range from communicating with like-minded individuals via the spreading of extremist um, narratives to the live streaming of terrorist attacks online. Um, the internet is no longer just an arena for extremist activism. It's become a place in which political ideologies are incubated, attacks are conceived, and social movements are made. Social media are the main platforms on which terrorist or extremist activity online takes place. Of course, terrorist organizations um, still have their own websites, their propaganda publications, um, such as the Amak News Agency of the so-called Islamic State. But as the Alliance to Counter Crime Online finds, 90% of terrorist activity on the internet takes place on social media networks. It's important to note briefly that radicalization um, or the perpetration of extremist violent acts rarely occurs entirely online, um, but it usually also has some form of real life component as well. Um, so social media is often used as um, a way to supplement existing face-to-face -face extremist relationships and networks. Um, however, the role of the traditional recruiters for radicalization has declined uh, with the rise of the internet as a propaganda and radicalization tool and as terrorist groups have evolved from these hierarchical organizations to more loosely knit networks um, that have more or less replaced the very strict hierarchical um, recruitment of Al-Qaeda, um, for example, for their specialized training camps in the 90s and early 2000s. What we see more and more of um, and have seen for some years are the so-called lone actors who conduct their extremist activities more or less alone um, and who are particularly active on social media. One might think of the attacks in Utøya and Christchurch or um, more recently in Hanau. Before getting any deeper into the topic, I want to briefly explain what I mean by extremist content and then look at different forms um, and characteristics of extremist content online. Um, there are, of course, significant debates about these definitions, um, which we can't get into today, and um, that would just lead too far. But just pragmatically, for the purpose of um, this brief input, I want to take extremism um, to mean the political ideologies that oppose a society's core values and principles. Um, so it's very important to note that extremism um, always is a, is a rational, uh, relative term, so it has this relative um, relation to something, it, something's extreme in relation to something other that's predefined. Extremist content can take many um, very different forms and there are very multiple different overlapping purposes that social media assumes for extremists. There's no way to talk through all of them today, but just to frame this um, discussion a bit, I want to mention a few and the most prevalent ones at this stage. Um, social media is, of course, mostly used to spread the ideological message of the ex respective extremist group, which can take, off, take on any form ranging from memes to short texts and posts to videos and full lecture series. Um, for example, um, one might think of Anwar al-Avlaki, who was one of the key ideologues of Al-Qaeda before he was killed in a US drone strike in 2011 and had published multiple lecture series on Islamist ideology that were freely available on YouTube. This can be targeted at potential new recruits um, or to further indoctrinate existing members. Social media also provides violent groups with a powerful mechanism to broadcast their terrorist attacks, um, beheadings, other violent acts. Most of you will remember the, the Christchurch attacker who live streamed um, his murder of 51 people in New Zealand in 2019. Um, at two mosques in Christchurch, um, which was live streamed on Facebook for a total of 17 minutes. And it took another 12 minutes after the attack for the, the video to be, um, to be flagged and then taken down. While this type of uh, online content um, is, of course, mostly geared towards existing like-minded individuals, it can also draw in individuals who just watch these videos because they come across them or because of curiosity, kind of spectators um, who are then drawn in. 
Social media is also a key platform to publish and disseminate instructional materials um, to support extremists in carrying out terrorist attacks. ISIS, Al-Qaeda and other groups, for example, will widely share um, instructions on how to build certain types of bombs, which, um, for instance, the 2013 Boston Marathon bombers um, used to build their devices. In this planning stage, social media networks like Telegram, for instance, can also provide semi-secure um, channels of communication that can be instrumental in planning these attacks. Um, for, for example, the Paris attackers of 2015 um, communicated via Telegram to um, conduct their attacks. Even more diverse than the forms of content extremists post online um, is the actual substance of their, their posts. Uh, it's almost impossible to cover all extremist ideologies ranging, ranging from the far right via Islamists, via misogynistic or single issue extremism. Um, there are just a few, few common characteristics that I want to talk about, um, but there's really no way of generalizing this content across all the different ideologies, so just a, a brief overview. Um, in addition to opposing a society's core norms and principles, extremist content often exhibits an excessive focus on perceived threats and injustices, which is combined with a frequent demonization and dehumanization of an outgroup. This form uh, is often this is often then used to form a sort of collective identity um, and to form an in-group or as a motivational frame to call like-minded individuals to action. For example, for right-wing extremists, it would translate to the framing of um, immigration or Islamization as a threat to national culture or identity, and is often combined with conspiracy theories, in this case, for instance, um, the Great Replacement Theory. Um, and it's also often combined with a persistent negativity, so they're often much more opposed to something than being for something. Extremist content also frequently calls for a new societal order in reaction to the threats that they have apparently identified. Um, and it's often supposed to be based on national history, culture, or religion. In the case of Islamist extremists, for example, um, this would be the very frequent reference to the Salafi or the rightly guided um, pious predecessors whose societal order they want to return to or reestablish. Or um, as a more recent example, we can think of the Reichsbürger who are, um, who are just uh, very much in the news right now, um, who even have, have the Reich in their name, the Kaiserreich that they want to uh, return to reestablish or they believe that still exists. So with this much uh, variance in extremist content online, it's clear that not all social media platforms serve the same purposes or the same groups um, to the same extent. Um, the largest, more established social media platforms, such as Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, are often used um, for the initial contact. This is, the entry threshold is very low, um, the platforms are free, they're easily accessible, uh, and someone might just stumble upon um, some sort of extremist content. Um, that's why, for example, groups like Hezbollah um, have a plethora of, of uh, Facebook groups that are widely accessible. Um, it's also on these platforms that new, newly radicalized individuals get drawn progressively further in. And that's a direct consequence of the algorithms used by social media platforms that aim at providing users with, with content that aligns with their worldview and that reinforces their bias. According to a June 2020 report from the Wall Street Journal, uh, who analyzed um, an internal Facebook survey of 2016, 64% uh, of all extremist group joins are due to their own recommendation tools. So 64% of the people that joined um, an extremist Facebook group got there via the recommendation tool of Facebook. Most of those came from the platform's groups you should join or discover algorithms. Therefore, many of the echo chambers prevalent today uh, exist because the largest social media companies designed their platforms to maximize user engagement and ignored the unintended consequences of algorithmic recommendations, ranking, and curation. Increasingly, these social media companies have recognized the problem after their misuse uh, has become known for election manipulation, political violence, and even genocide, if we think of the role of Facebook in the persecution of the Rohingya in Myanmar. 
Facebook committed at least nominally to content moderation and, for example, prohibited posting Holocaust denials. And following the German Network Enforcement Act, social media companies started taking down more and more extremist content. This ha has led to a re uh, considerable reduction of extremist content on the internet. Uh, for example, a study by the Leibniz Center for European Economic Research found in an evaluation of 200,000 far-right Twitter accounts that not only the number of extremist posts declined by around 8%, but also that the intensity of the hate that was portrayed in these postings declined. So in this context, we have to consider the second order effects and take into account the indirect effects of the reduction in intensity as more extreme posts also gain more visibility and then are shared more frequently. The reduction of extremist content, however, of course has not eradicated the problem. Many extremists simply moved to different platforms or modified their communication strategies to circumvent prosecution by law enforcement or uh, removal by content moderators. They've done so by using slang, memes, or coded language that's not as easily uh, discernible. Multiple studies on deplatforming found that extremists find alternative networks to disseminate content um, by the actors whose accounts were deleted in the first place. As larger platforms are increasingly moderating and the content and deleting accounts, actors move to different smaller platforms that are less regulated, um, and Telegram is especially popular in, in this regard. The app has almost no content moderation, even though that is growing. Um, but also users get push alerts for new posts and the app provides the option to, um, to easily switch between private messaging options and open channels, channels that have an immense reach. Telegram is especially popular with the far right um, as a study by the Amadeo Antonio Stiftung who um, looked at far right hate actors found that 96% of the actors they analyzed were active on, on Telegram and many understood the platform to be their communicative base. Other platforms include Parler, which officially tells users to speak freely and express yourself openly without fear of being the platform for your views. Or Gab, which is um, particularly used by white supremacists in the US. While the reduction of extremist contests um, overall is, a, is definitely a positive, the move to small, smaller platforms um, by extremists also harbors the danger that the discussion becomes even more extreme on these niche platforms. We could also talk about Reddit here um, and smaller, more extreme subreddits. Um, and, and platforms like Parler or Telegram therefore often play a more significant role further down in the radicalization process. And maybe this also opens up a, a significant question for reg regulators. So which kind of extremist content should they tackle? Where should they tackle it? Um, and what's sort of the, uh, the entry point to moderate um, the extremist content online? And I'm, I'm glad to hand over back to Katja and then to my two final panelists to talk about